Hi everybody, it's Cash. Welcome back. Thank you very much for joining me today. I've got lots of fascinating stuff, as always, including Tim Walls. Now that he is officially Kamala Harris's VP pick, I thought I'd take a look at his life over the next six months, see if that gave us a clue about the result of the election. Speaking of which, I also did Republicans versus Democrats. I haven't done that for a while, and uh, I thought I'd do them for the next six months. See how that's going to go. Plus, Trump's consciousness. What on earth was he thinking during that disastrous press conference the other day when he just spouted a stream of lies and drivel. I thought I'd take a look in his head and see what his state of mind was, plus the Ukraine invasion of Russia. Whoever thought I'd be saying those words? But I got some really intriguing downloads for that, which I will tell you later, plus Tim Waltz and J.D. Vance. Assuming J.D. Vance isn't dumped by Trump before the election, I thought I'd put those two together and see what might happen, plus a whole bunch more. Now, before we crack on, there's a new video up on the Enlightened Beings Club channel dealing with an encounter I had last weekend with actor, singer, and generally all-round talented guy, Jamie Foxx. While I was talking to him, I got pictures. And I thought I'd tell you what they are because they're so interesting, but also incredibly reassuring about how we are guarded in life and guided. And so if you want to see that, I'll put a link to it in the show notes below this video. Really, really interesting. Uh, many of you said, hey, why have you not done pictures for Tim Walls? Kamala Harris's VP pick. Well, the answer to that is she'd only just picked him when I did the last video. But uh, now that she has, I went into his consciousness, first of all. And you know those old zoetrope machines? They had still pictures on the inside, but when you look through a little slit and you turn the thing, the pictures appeared to move. And he, there he is, he was standing in one of those. It was spinning around him, suggesting that he had a very worldly 360 degree perspective on life. He really knew a lot of stuff, but at the same time, he could isolate individual issues and focus on those as well. So he would seem to be a very, very mature guy to have on the ticket. But I thought, you know, elections are tricky. Maybe I should take a quick look at him over the next six months and see how his life might go. That might give an indication of what will happen at election time. And when I did, he was on a podium. There he is. But almost immediately, he began to reverse off the podium. Almost as if what we're seeing currently is his performance, a stage persona, him being a bit of a star in his own domain. But it wasn't really him. That was all a mask fakery. And behind the scenes, he was really more interested in getting down to work, in isolating the issues rather than looking at the broader picture and being a personality. It felt very serious, like he wasn't terribly interested in being the centre of attention, which is good if you're a VP pick, I suppose. And he withdrew, withdrew, withdrew onto a raised path that was rather like those covers that electricians put over wires and hoses or whatever else they do in the street to start pedestrians tripping over them. It was a cover for something, and it led into a tunnel. Anxiety, concerns, fears, worries, but not serious ones. I think this may relate to the GOP's attempts to swift boat the guy, uh, you know, like they did with John Kerry back in the day, but it's not going to work with Tim Walls. He seemed to deal with it by simply getting off his little raised path, walking around, handling it, and then carrying on out the other side. So this is a temporary setback. However, this is where it got really interesting because it led to a darker tunnel. Something was coming his way that would not be good at all. If he went into that second tunnel, 
Things got very, very dark, and it was a kind of dead end. I followed him through, and when he emerged on the other side, he was on a little platform over ocean. It was all very pleasant and quiet, but it didn't seem like any kind of success. It felt like he'd simply dealt with the problem, uh, overcome it, and come out the other side. So the indication is that whatever this might be, he must let it go or rise above it or do something that doesn't get him caught up in it because that could lead to the downfall of the ticket, basically. He had to go over the tunnel entrance and start climbing. This is going to be a really tough and challenging election cycle. I know everybody's in a honeymoon period now. Everybody's ecstatic about Tim Walz and Kamala Harris, and she's up in the polls. But remember, the pictures keep saying the candidates must not get complacent because there will be a temptation to slack off. And in Tim Walz's case, that would not pay off. Because at the top of this slope, once he got over the hill, I assume that's the election itself, there was a boggy, dark, seductively evil, swampy thing. The actual finish line, the success, triumph, victory line, was above him. Now, if he sank down into the bog, that would be a tragedy for him and for the Harris campaign. He had to climb up to this higher level. And when he did... In the pictures, he lay there absolutely exhausted. It had taken every ounce of energy he had to overcome the obstacles pitted against him, and I assume against Kamala Harris. This was very wearing on the system. I will do pictures later on for you for Tim Walz and J.D. Vance, because those tie in with these, as you'll see, and those are indicative too. Incidentally, did you see that in the Arizona Senate race between Carrie Lake <laughs> and uh, Ruben Gallego, they are not neck and neck, as was previously thought. In fact, Carrie Lake is about 11 points behind in the polls. Now, we don't place much credence on polls here, but it does look as though the pictures are coming true for that. Remember, she was a helium balloon, just floating along, couldn't change her approach, was stuck in the Trump MAGA mold, even as the MAGA movement is stumbling. And Ruben Gallego was really putting in the effort, going up ramps, climbing staircases, doing all that. And uh, I think, ultimately, his efforts will pay off because she simply couldn't change trajectory. So if Trump goes down, for example, then Carrie Lake will go down with him. Uh, there are a couple of other MAGA candidates that I've done pitches for who lost their races recently. One of them is Cece Truman. Remember her? She was running for the U.S. House of Representatives in California's 25th Congressional District. And although she got 17% of the vote, which is a lot, really, for her, she didn't win. And the pictures said she wouldn't. Remember, she was climbing that cliff face, and the whole thing was basically crumbling as she did so. And that's really what happened. She went absolutely nowhere. Same with Valentina Gomez, a Republican who was running for the Secretary of State job in Missouri. And I guess she might have got it had she not been so blatantly homophobic and expressing hate. Don't be gay! It was absolutely horrible. What a terrible campaign. And it's very, very sad. There's no room for that now. We're moving into an era of love and acceptance and compassion and kindness and forgiveness. Uh, hate is not going to stand much of a chance in the future, particularly with young people. And speaking of Missouri, let me put in a quick mention of the race between Josh Hawley and Lucas Coons, who's my bellwether Democratic candidate for the Senate race there. They were quiet for a very long time, and now the race has exploded over the issue of debates. 
They are really going for it. Good for Lucas Coons coming out of his corner, finally. Because remember, there was a hint of complacency in the pitchers that he would get a sleeping bag and just go to sleep and assume that all would be well. Or be overwhelmed by Josh Hawley's campaign and think, eh, why even bother? But now that's changed. Maybe the injection of Kamala Harris into the race has made a huge difference to Lucas Coons. But on Twitter, they're fighting. Josh Hawley says, I will meet you at the governor's ham breakfast <laughs> and we'll debate openly whereas Lucas Kuhn says hang on a minute no I want it to be a properly officiated moderated debate in a tv studio Fox has said we'll host it yes 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 five debates come on and uh, Josh Hawley says no 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 stop dancing around Coons I want to see you at the county fair at the governor's ham breakfast <laughs> so I don't know how that's going to work out but that would be in September I think if it happens in the studio and I think next week if it's at the ham breakfast <laughs> Whether it affects the outcome of the race in terms of the pitchers, I don't really know. I went into the energy one more time just to take a look. There they are side by side. And it was almost a repeat of past pitchers because there was a hook hanging down, probably the Republican election machine. Josh Hawley grabbed it and it took him away to higher elevations, leaving Lucas Coons down on the ground. Then Josh Hawley went into a little trapdoor in the sky and from there was able to walk along pretty carefreely. Lucas Coons didn't seem to have a good time after that. There was a hill that usually represents the election, but it may not, I don't know. And beyond that was a ramp that was illuminated. There was sunlight coming down onto this ramp. I got the feeling not of triumph, but of liberation more. You know, in a movie studio, on a sound stage, they build a set, and if they do the set well, it can feel like its own little world. You could totally believe that you're in that place. But at the end of the day, when the camera's off, you walk out of the set, out of the sound stage, into reality, and suddenly it's like, oh, wow, this is the real world. That wasn't the real world. That was a subjective reality. This is what this felt like, walking out of a set, out of uh, a soundstage uh, and a movie studio and into real life. I think he will have learned a lot from this campaign about himself, about politics, about Josh Hawley, but uh, maybe it's not about winning, it's about what he learns about himself. That may be the case. Of course, if he wins, then great. That's uh, going to stand him in good stead too, but let's just test it. Let's do a muscle test. You can join in too. Nothing hangs on this. I always say that. It's just for fun. But let's see if the fingers know who will win in that race. Uh, Josh Hawley hangs on to his Senate seat in November. Lucas Kuntz, the Democrat, takes Josh Hawley's Senate seat in November. Lucas Coons will be in the U.S. Senate next year. Josh Hawley will be in the U.S. Senate next year. There you go. According to the fingers, anyway, a lot rides on this. Don't let me down. Yeah, fine. Uh, according to the fingers, Josh Hawley, a very, very pro-Trump guy, wins this time, too. It's remarkable who is backing away from Trump. Now, did you notice at that terrible press conference he held at Mar-a-Lago, there was no Trump van sign at the front. It just said Mar-a-Lago on the front. That's very, very strange. And you've got people like Joe Rogan, Tim Poole, who were gung-ho for Trump for the longest time, have said, no, 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 we're not voting for him now. Almost as if they know something that we don't, and they're abandoning him ahead of time. So they don't look foolish. But obviously, a vote for RFK Jr. is a wasted vote, and probably a way of getting Trump in by the back door. It's interesting, actually, that the Mormon Church, the Church of Jesus Christ, 
Christ of Latter-day Saints, they're backing away from Trump as well. I think 73% of Mormons in Utah are Republican. But there is a youth vote involved in this. There are Latter-day Saints for Kamala Harris now. And I think the Mormon church is sort of saying, yeah, maybe this election cycle, we won't support the Republicans. I went into the energy of that. I put the Mormon church alongside the Republican Party. And the Mormons had a tray that had rocks on it. I know they look like profiteroles. <laughs> Don't at me over that, as the kids say. But um, there was a tray of rocks. And they went over to a little trench where the Republicans were walking along, stuck in their groove. And the Mormons just tipped the tray of rocks into the trench covering the feet of the Republican Party and stopping them moving forward temporarily. It's almost as if the church is saying, we would like to go with the young people who are waking up and invigorating our movement. We want to go for embracing people and loving and being kind and so on. And uh, therefore, they are not backing the Republicans this time. Uh, but this kind of thing is going on all over the world. I've talked about it before. Uh, I mentioned Venezuela, where people are rising up against corruption and the old ways and the patriarchy. And uh, in Bangladesh, where students actually unseated the prime minister and overtook the prime minister's palace, they're waking up and moving things forward. I would put in the same basket as these awakenings the situation between Russia and Ukraine. Actually, I know it doesn't seem like the same thing, but you've got Russia assuming it could just take over another country and the other country going, no, no, in fact, not only are we going to stand up to you, we're going to attack you and invade your country. And now Ukraine is going into Russia as a warning and Putin is startled, doesn't know what to do, is paralyzed um, because this was not expected. In fact, he's outraged. It's like, how dare you? Well, of all the nerve. But I thought I'll just take a look again at the pictures between Russia and Ukraine to remind people of what I've said before or new people who come along. I don't do wars or anything episodic because there are too many things going on at the same time and it does seem that the pictures can't quite pin them down somehow. So this isn't about the war itself. I simply put Russia and Ukraine side by side to see what might happen. And immediately there were two waves. It's always about waves, these things. But two forces, basically. Two waves smashing against each other in the ocean. But then I went under the waves and something really intriguing was happening. I saw a set of dials on a wall. Uh, it was a bit like a combination lock. I thought, and the metal arm came in and started fiddling with the dials as if trying to find the right combination. This was all going on underwater. So while the war, the battles were raging upstairs on the surface, down here, something a little sly was happening. Somebody was trying to find a way in. But eventually, this metal arm turned the dials, the panel fell away, and two doors opened. So I swam, that's me, I, <laughs> with a snorkel. I swam in and there was a long passageway that I had to go through, all underwater, of course, uh, a large passageway, which eventually ended at a shaft that was full of dark spikes. Uh, I don't know what that was, but I had to swim all the way up the inside of it. But then at some point the water ended and I had to climb the rest of the way as if scaling the outside of a skyscraper. And on the very top was a needle. I tucked it under my arm and then swam all the way back down again and out the door and was gone. I had what I had come for. So it was a two-stage thing. Find the combination, get in there, grab the needle, and then leave. This was the secret tool I was looking for. Now, it may represent the initiative, taking control of the war, of the narrative. 
or taking out a particular person, some goal that they had, but they had to do it under the waves, fiddle with the combination. And once they found the right combination, they could go through this arduous process of finding this needle and then swim out with it. Mission accomplished. But it's all about colonialism having had its day and the young realizing that we live in one big old world and we got to get along. So the friction points are happening in various countries, such as the UK. That would be an example over the past couple of weeks with the riots and stuff. But it's gone back centuries, this, when... Countries like Britain went around the world just colonizing different places and imposing their culture and their will on the locals. Somebody said, could you do pictures for the Waitangi Treaty? Uh, sure, why not? <laughs> what is it? Uh, it turns out that it's a document signed in the 19th century. Waitangi is an area on the North Island of New Zealand. In fact, isn't it part Waitangi, part of the name of that mountain? Because on forever, the name is really, really long, like... Uh, that's it. Tamata Waitangi, that one. And I think it means wolf and a man going up a mountainside and finding a hut. <laughs> it's just a very long-winded way of saying it. But uh, Waitangi is this area that the Maori control, and of course the colonial people come in, like the British, and go, we would like the whole area, please, but out of respect for the fact that you were here before we were, we're going to sign an agreement with you saying that you can keep the land, you can keep the minerals, and whatever. And the Maori go, sure, they inhabited the land forever. And they go, sure, we'll sign an agreement. The thing was, though, the, the English version of the agreement had to be translated into the Maori. And whoever did it tricked them. And it wasn't an exact replica. So over the years, they lost a lot of their land. I mean, some of it was sold off and stuff, and it was all legitimate, but it was the land, and it was the minerals, and the forests, and so on, and the Maori have found themselves encroached upon ever since. And somebody said, well, you look at this agreement and see what the vibe is of it. So there is the document, and when I went into the energy of that, there was a curl of something. Now, you might think, oh, well, it's a scroll of parchment, but it's not. It was more like a hair roller. Very unromantic, but more like a hair roller. And this hair roller, representing the treaty, I assume, uh, was floating high in what felt like a barn, a very old building, a barn, and there was a skylight and the hair roller was floating in front of the skylight. Couldn't get out, but was getting the benefit of the light. And when I went outside the barn and looked in, the attitude, the feeling was, oh, look, that uh, the Maori, the, uh, the land or whatever, is floating inside the barn and it's trapped. But we dare let it out because you never know the damage it will do. Rather like saying, we should go into the attic and clean it out. I'm interested what's up there. And then you go, yeah, but there are spiders and ooh, it's going to be dirty. We haven't been up there for years. It felt like something that you should do something about, but you don't want to because of what it might unleash, that kind of thing. But the answer to this issue, surprisingly, was not to go on about the past, not to drone on or complain or whine or feel put upon. You might think, well, why not? They're justified. True. But that is all to do with low vibration. Again, the law of attraction. Oh, I've written a book about that. Uh, the law of attraction says if you focus on what's wrong then you don't find a solution. You simply attract to you more reasons to feel wronged. And that's what was going on here. What happened is, if the Maori released their attachment to this hair curl or this document, this treaty, whatever it was, they would float down and they would find that the structure of the barn was rotting. 
It was rainy outside, I thought, but the structure was rotting after so long. And they would find a solution that they liked, or a compromise anyway that was satisfactory. But as long as they were up by the window pining and feeling wronged, they just get more reasons to feel wronged and hard done by and put out. Relax, surrender, yield, and a new solution would present itself. A solution you couldn't see when you were up there because it was down here. Anyway, back to Tim Walls. He's set to debate J.D. Vance if J.D. Vance actually stays the course, which he may not. But I thought I would put them side by side because J.D. Vance is having a terrible time. He's such a creepy man. Who knew? And uh, if he does survive to November, it won't be because Trump wants him there. That's for sure. But uh, I put Tim Walls and J.D. Vance side by side to see what might happen. And when I did, there they are, I thought they were raring to go. But immediately, J.D. Vance walked away, sat under a tree with a picnic blanket and began eating a sandwich. Tim Walls goes, hey, are you not coming along? Are you not playing this game? J.D. Vance takes another bite of his sandwich and goes, oh, you go right ahead. I'll catch up later. Very strange, reinforcing the idea that something else is going on that they have a secret plan they've not divulged yet. I know Trump has claimed that he has nothing whatsoever to do with Project 2025, and yet a photo has surfaced of him with Kevin Roberts on a private plane. Uh, so that's untrue. And I noticed that Kevin Roberts's book about Project 2025 with a foreword by J.D. Vance has been shelved until after the election. It won't be published until then. So there must be something pretty horrific and tell tale in that book that they don't want people to know. But anyway, J.D. Vance says, you go right ahead. And Tim Walls continues. He goes over a little hill. And once he's over the hill, J.D. Vance leaps up, gathers together his picnic things and runs over to, uh, I don't know, a little go-kart thing or whatever this thing was that started moving forward with him on it. It goes for a little while, very easy for J.D. Vance. Then he gets off, scrambles up a hill, and right ahead is that platform I mentioned in the Tim Walls pictures earlier on. Same platform, same ending. That's where they're both heading. Only J.D. Vance slips. In the pictures, he lost his footing and he slid down on gravel and didn't get up again. Meanwhile, Tim Walls was climbing up the steep slope, lots of effort involved, and finally, ooh, he made it onto the platform, and he was done. He got there, and the road ahead from then on seemed to be pretty clear. So it does look from these pictures as well as though Tim Walls makes it, and J.D. Vance doesn't. Lovely. But we can muscle test that. So, J.D. Vance will be the vice president in 2025. No, Tim Walls will be the vice president of the United States in 2025. Very, very strong. So, those uh, results echo what I got for J.D. Vance before, that he will never be uh, vice president and will never be president. And I'm not absolutely sure either that Trump is going to make it as far as November. If I were on his campaign team, I'd be saying, look, dude, because that's how I talk when I'm not on camera. Look, dude, you've got to give up. Quit the race. Feign some kind of illness, an aneurysm, a heart attack, a, a stroke or something that gives you a legitimate out because you're going to be horrible in the debates and your campaign rallies are looking more and more ridiculous. You're saying terrible things. Get out and make an excuse. Uh, did you notice that for the very first time at that uh, press conference the other day, the one that was absolutely terrible, he didn't have his orange makeup on, his tanning thing. He was white. 
And I wonder whether that's uh, a precursor to them saying, well, see that press conference, he looked really pale. That was not a well guy. I went into the energy of that press conference, by the way, just to see how Trump was feeling, what was going on in his consciousness. And when I looked out through his eyes, there were all the reporters in front of me, and it was as if there was a large hole in the ceiling and water was pouring through it into my face. I couldn't see or hear anybody, really. I don't think anything they said was making sense. I was just garbling because I was focused on all this water coming towards me. It was so distracting. It's almost like there was a separation between the physical on the one side and the mental and psychological on the other. He was just yakking away, just saying stuff on automatic like a robot while his brain was befuddled and bewildered and swamped with all this stuff. And of course, the journalists in the journalists, ha, the journalists in the room gave him such an easy time and didn't query any of the nonsense. The reason, I suppose, is because their bosses are Republicans, they're Trump supporters, and they fear the journalists fear losing their jobs, so they don't do their job, and therefore they should lose their job. But how does all of the stuff that's happened over the past couple of weeks impact the race between Republicans and Democrats in November? I did this a long time ago, if you remember, and I showed the pictures a couple of episodes ago, maybe. Remember where the Democrats were walking along across this wide open plain and this huge wave came over and swept the Republicans aside until they were standing in the water right alongside the Democrats, as though they had to merge their efforts. And this seems to be coming true, even without a big event happening to unite the nation or unite the parties, there seems to be this natural gravitation of sensible, sane, normal Republicans towards the centre and even the centre-left so that they can unite with the Democrats to unseat the MAGA people and get Trump out of there before he does any more damage. So those pictures actually are coming true in unexpected ways. There is a kind of merger of the two sides. But I went into the race again just to see what might happen. Democrats and Republicans standing side by side. There they are. This was a tricky set of pictures to get my head around. Clearly, there's a lot of emotion and anxiety surrounding this. But you've got to imagine one of those transport aircraft that the army uses or they appear in Mission Impossible movies, you know, when Tom Cruise is clinging to the side of them. And inside the fuselage of this otherwise empty plane, there was a large roll of paper, the sort they make newspapers out of. The paper, as it unspooled from the roll, ran the full length of the fuselage and then outside. It dangled out in the wind, which started tearing bits off it. Republicans and Democrats were inside the plane, scrambling madly and frantically to claw their way along the paper, which was still unspooling and dragging them backwards. It was quite a fight. So much at stake here. Eventually, they made their way towards the roll. But as they did so, the race became so mad, so aggressive, so competitive, that by means of their clawing, they tore the paper off the roll and began slipping backwards with it. They might fly right out the back and all would be lost. But at this point, interestingly, the Democrats, seeing what had happened simply got off the paper and left the Republicans still on it, flying out the back of the plane. What I think had happened was that the Republicans were so determined to win, so determined to get what they wanted by any means possible, including, obviously, cheating, they're Republicans, um, that they tried too hard. They destroyed the very effort that they had put in to winning. It cancelled itself out. They actually broke the process. And the Democrats, realising this, 
said, okay, well, it's on your head. You deal with it. And the Republicans went, what? I'm sorry, what? Away! By wanting it so much, the Republicans actually defeated their own efforts. Again, it's true in the law of attraction. If you want something so much, you're saying to the universe, I don't have it. And the universe goes, all oh, right, so you want more of the same, right? And it brings you more of what you don't have. This seemed to be the underlying narrative of the Republican desperation to win in November. And it may take until January, February, and so on. Don't do your leprechaun kicks in November. Save them until, in fact, Try not to do them at all. You could break a hip. <laughs> but <laughs> please don't do them. But, um, you know, it's not leprechaun kick time until maybe, maybe even January, February, March, something like that. I don't know. But uh, ultimately, it will be leprechaun kick time. We'll see. But let's test it right now. Republicans win the 2024 election. No. Oh. Democrats win the 2024 election. That is the same result I always get. Uh, with the old fingers and also with the new ones, which hopefully won't let me down. All right, that's all I've got. Thank you very much for watching. I really appreciate it. It's goodbye from him. And it's goodbye from me. See you soon, guys. Bye-bye.